Welcome to the final installment of Hims TV's deep dive on cybersecurity. While the first three videos in this series focused on the whys and hows of healthcare hackers, this episode will hone in on the practical steps organizations can take to combat cyber attacks. Speaking from experience, these public and private sector experts are highlighting proven strategies to limit or even prevent breaches, and there's a lot to take into account. I think a resilient enterprise has a security protocol across the board. A resilient healthcare uh, industry participant, particularly a hospital, you have to belong to the information sharing uh, analytical centers. You have to do that. You're going to get information from HHS. More importantly, you get information from other healthcare uh, entities. You have a chief risk officer. Do you assess the risk to your system? Do you monitor your system on a 24 7 basis? It's not just about putting in defensive malware. It's not just like putting up a perimeter. Those days are long gone. Have you spent the extra dollars to uh, embed other defensive measures in your digital, uh, in, in your digital system? Uh, do you have a chief risk officer? Uh, is your board of directors aware? I know they're focused on quality health care, but are they aware and sensitive to the fact that you are a huge target and you know, some decisions may have to be made instead of one more piece of medical equipment. Maybe we better get our chief technology officer a few more resources to make sure that we have a, uh, uh, a good uh, digital uh, system that's protected as much as we can. For him, Security and Privacy Committee member Richard Stainings, it all starts with an honest conversation about what defenses an organization lacks and whether it has the resources to fill those gaps. They lack the expertise, they lack the capabilities and the tools um, in order to play in this advanced form of medical delivery and also securing all of those, uh, the medical industry in which we now uh, rely. Um, consolidation is obviously going to help in that respect and that's ongoing and we've seen that for the last 10 years as hospital systems consolidate down. I think also the growth in expert managed services is going to be critical to those organizations. Does it make sense for me as the leader of a hospital system to go out and try and hire a number of experts that you know can manage my big data analytics for me? Or does it make more sense for me to procure that as a service from someone who specializes in that space? Does it make sense for me to try and attract and retain top security talent? Particularly given the financial uh, constraints of, of the healthcare industry. Um, healthcare cannot compete with financial services, for example. There's a 12x demand over supply for security professionals across the United States right now. That means that unless healthcare has a lot of money, right, a, a very well-funded healthcare organization, they're not going to be able to compete with the, the JP Morgan Chases and the, uh, and the other large financial institutions out there that can attract and retain whoever they want. So it leads to the need to understand where to spend scarce dollars, right? And I think uh, for the smaller healthcare institutions, it means procurement of managed services um, or expert services that I can procure uh, cheap, cheaper, better, faster to protect my environment. On the one hand, Cybersecurity is a responsibility that can't simply be bolted onto a hospital's existing IT department, but requires dedicated individuals with specific expertise. On the other, both departments need to be working in concert to effectively protect the entire organization, says Secure Ideas CEO Kevin Johnson. We have to stop thinking about security and IT as separate entities, right? The reality is they're one group that have to work together. Both inform each other. It's not a one-way conversation. So security is gonna to come to IT and say, here are some of the risks, here are some of the attacks, and here's what they do and how they work. And IT has to be able to come back and say, yeah, but this is the business critical functionality. This is the stuff we need to accomplish. And there's a third leg there, and that is the organization itself. The information security function is getting elevated outside of IT or at least if it's in IT, it's getting much better reporting at the executive level and C-level so that you get visibility into engaging the entire enterprise in understanding how to protect the information, understanding the risks and threats associated with when we don't do this well, what are the bad things that can happen, and then allowing, uh, supporting the organization and responding to, to incidents as a business as opposed to as a IT technical problem. Right. So that's, that's where we've headed. I think 
the next wave. So that, that's all happening now. Like right. security and privacy and compliance are all mushing together and right. um, it's coming out of IT in a lot of ways. I think that's going to continue. It's not just the people that need to be on the same page, but their systems as well. Any individual organization has a handful of different tools monitoring its operations. But siloing these within specific departments or facilities makes it near impossible for security teams to do their jobs. For example, if I've got one tool that tells me that I've got uh, a potential indicator of compromise, a uh, potential, potential issue with identity and access management, and I've got a different tool that's telling me there's something hinky going on on my perimeter, and I've got another tool that's telling me there's something hinky going on on my east-west traffic across my network. In Isolation, none of those devices, none of those tools tell me that I'm under attack. When I combine them all together or where I'm sharing telemetry between different tools, then obviously that gives me much greater levels of confidence uh, that is an IOC, right? Um, that there's an issue going on on my network that I need to, to, to manage appropriately. Um, a risk-based approach is going to identify where the risks are on my network, so what the potential impact is uh, to patient safety, for example, right? Um, what the impact is to the integrity of the information that I'm entrusting um, to my IT systems. Um, and also, more importantly, the availability of IT systems in order to, to render care to patients, right? We've seen with um, the WannaCry attacks um, and a number of wipeaware attacks and other types of attacks that availability is now critical to patient safety. Um, whereas five years ago, or 10 years ago, um, the confidentiality of PHI was, um, was most important. Today, we're now talking about the availability and the integrity of information with which uh, clinicians and physicians uh, are reliant upon uh, treating patients, right? If that information is compromised, uh, and a medical record gives me as a physician the wrong information to treat a patient, I could kill that patient. The average hospital system has between 45 and 65 different security vendors in its security toolbox. Um, for me, if, I'm, if I've got an incident going on in a hospital system and I need to look at 65 different consoles to understand what's happening, um, that's going to be nearly impossible. By the time I, under, I have a good understanding of what's happening, the perpetrators would have been in, out, long gone, damage conducted. So I need to get that number of vendors down to a more manageable uh, number um, where information is being shared amongst my different vendors. Um, and I'm avoiding the shiny object of one particular uh, tool that is my panacea to, to solve all of my, my security problems. It may be pessimistic to say it's only a matter of time until your organization is breached, but this kind of mindset can really go a long way. Should any part of the organization be compromised, well-designed fail-safes can greatly limit the damage that would incur. One such approach is system and data segmentation, a strategy that Fortalize Solutions' Teresa Payton, who previously served as CIO at the Bush White House, says should be common practice both in and outside of healthcare. The best one that we used at the White House and still use today is segment it to save it. Which means? Basically thinking about logical and physical separation. Very simply in your personal life, it could be multiple email addresses. One segmentation is your bank account. One is your health care. One is your kid's school. One's marketing. Mm -hmm. So be thinking about how do you segment it to save it. You take it at a grander scale in the hospitals. It could be you segment your third party vendors from your patient health data from your medical equipment, from your Internet of Things devices. Build your network in a way that means that it, when you do suffer uh, an intrusion, you can limit and contain the damage. You want to be able to make sure that the uh, adversary can't just randomly wander around your entire network. You want to be able to contain it. You also want to be able to detect it as rapidly as possible so that you know that you've had a problem. Uh, and then you want to have a good incident response plan in place so that you can move quickly uh, to address an intrusion when you have it and um, get rid of the adversary from your systems. That will not protect you against um, all attacks everywhere, but it will mean that when you do suffer an intrusion, you can limit the effect on your organization. Another worthwhile consideration is the organization's current insurance policy. It's important to know the extent to which a cyber attack would be covered or whether an investment needs to be made into a more specialized plan. 
a lot of organizations are starting to think about cyber insurance. So when you're thinking about it, what are actually you, the protections that you get from cyber insurance? I think that's one of the biggest questions that isn't asked. Uh, sometimes people think that by having cyber insurance, they don't really need anything else and they're not really thinking about what's in the policy. You actually want to read the policy before you sign up for it because I think as people learn with many things, the sales pitch doesn't necessarily reflect what's in the product. The other thing with cyber insurance that gets missed is the information you would provide to the insurer when you're signing up for it. Uh, you're going to get a very detailed questionnaire and if you're not fully accurate in there, you can end up finding that your coverage is denied because the insurer is basing the issuance of the policy on the information you provide to them. And then another actually probably preliminary issue that people are misconstruing about cyber insurance is whether they in fact need it in the first place. And you can probably tell from the beginning part of the answer that yes, you actually do want it. But people think that it might be part of their general liability or given that we're in healthcare, that the professional liability might include it. Sometimes that is the case where you do have some covered, but it's not going to be nearly as robust as a standalone policy. And there's probably going to be a lot more carve outs uh, from the coverage. So you're really not going to be nearly as protected as you are with a standalone policy. A healthcare organization's resources extend well beyond their own walls. Government bodies command a wealth of experience when it comes to cyber threats. An organization shouldn't be afraid to seek out their local agencies or any other industry experts when planning their defenses, says FBI Special Agent M.K. Palmore. No one entity can really tackle this issue alone. Uh, we understand that our partnerships and our relationships uh, between government and private sector are really important aspects of how we're going to build bridges in order to create solutions to the problems that we're all experiencing in this realm. So what, what does that look like in practical terms? Uh, for instance, here in San Francisco, uh, where I run the cybersecurity investigative teams for the FBI, uh, we lean into outreach uh, in a way that historically has not been done. We try as best we can, one, to get out and sort of proselytize on what the FBI's responsibilities are in the mission space of cybersecurity investigations. And then secondarily, we like to get in and spend one-on-one -on -one time with our counterparts within the private sector at the C-suite level, and in some cases, certainly boards of directors, where we like to explore and explain from our perspective trends, issues that we're seeing on the cyber threat landscape. And in a lot of those cases or instances, uh, there are oftentimes indicators of compromise or a deeper technical conversation that's allowed to happen because doors have been opened between ourselves and our counterparts in the private sector. And we'll actually get into the nitty gritty of actually pr providing uh, detailed uh, briefings to members within that enterprise who are in a need to know uh, so that they can then again capture uh, additional contextual aspects of the cyber threat landscape and it helps them better posture themselves. The best thing to do is to reach out to your local FBI office. FBI is positioned in 56 cities throughout the um, United States and even attached to those main offices or what we call satellite offices or resident agencies. And so nearly in every, almost every city that you're in, there's an FBI presence of some kind in that city. Uh, make a call to the local office, ask to speak to either the cyber supervisor or the cyber ASAC, uh, and you will be put in touch with individuals in that local office that can then engage you locally. Many enterprises don't know what the investment in their security apparatus needs to look like, so they don't want to waste money, so they turn to folks who are experts in this realm, the cloud vendors, other security professionals for what we call sort of the managed services portfolio. And I think managed services is a direction that many enterprises will go uh, in the future because that is one of the ways that you can sort of leverage not just the knowledge base, but also the personnel and resources for an entity that can help you with your cybersecurity posture outside of having people sit in the space um, in your enterprise. As in most other things, a good team is stronger than the individual. By participating in and contributing to an Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or ISAC, Individual groups can receive specific guidance on new malware or tactics from those who are on the front lines. One of the things that the ISAC does for you, if you are a member, and I encourage everybody to join, is that if another one of your colleagues, another hospital else has been attacked, and they belong to the ISAC and share that information, there may be a precursor that you ought to be aware of. Or if there's been a specific attack, there'll be the malware specifically identified 
What was the point of entry? What did you do in order to restrict its movement through your digital system? And finally, what did you do in terms of the antidote? So again, the Intel community, what you need to learn from them is timely and relevant information. You need to apply it immediately. And that's why the Intel community, particularly HHS in the healthcare industry, sharing that information with you. Health industry shares it with the ISAC. And between those two sources, uh, you're a lot better prepared to protect uh, the safety and security of your patients and the data that you've accumulated over the years. Not to be forgotten is the enormous influence health systems have on the technology vendor's bottom line. Emphasizing security during business negotiations will send a clear message to vendors that building protection into their products is well worth the investment, says Parham F. Takari, Executive Director of the Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technology. Regulation is, you know, one of the solutions. Um, I think you have to incentivize financially, so we have to find ways to get sector ecosystems, if you will, to find uh, financial motivation. I think one of the things that is not discussed enough is that the buyers of technology, they have power. If, if companies, particularly in the government and kind of large enterprise level organizations say, look, I'm not going to spend money with you. I'm going to go to your competitor because I feel that your competitor is delivering the more secure solutions that I need. Or if they just demand more secure products, I think organizations will start to realize that, hey, my client, my potential client is actually buying based on security. I think that we'll see it start seeing changes there. And I think While ensuring secure solutions is a challenge in itself, perhaps the toughest battles are those for the hearts and minds of the individuals who will need to embrace these security first processes, says Ronald Petru. CMIO of Radboud University Medical Center. This is not a technology thing. This is, as you say, this is a change in behavior yeah. thing. You have to offer attractive solutions for people that they really want to work with because it makes life easier. But it's a difficult task. And on the other hand, of course, making people aware of the risks mm -hmm. and aware of the consequences that happen. Also, because all technologies, uh, even if they're not very safe, they are widely accepted as more or less safe. So sending messages through a fax or through a paper uh, mail in an envelope, well, if you would introduce that technology nowadays, it would probably not pass. But since it has been established over the years, it's considered, well, accepted and more mm -hmm. or less safe. So that sometimes explains why modern technologies that are actually better uh, are difficult to implement. People are a core component of cybersecurity but can often be sidelined by a focus on tech-driven solutions or processes. So far, the industry has failed to adequately explore and address the human factor, and must begin to do so if real changes are to be made. Do we understand organizational psychology? Do we understand how to motivate people? Do we understand the basic tenets of communication? Do we understand how people learn? We're great at technology, and we're actually fair to middling at process, or we're great at process and we're fair to middling at technology. But that people end of the people process and technology triad is something we have not emphasized, and it's something we haven't focused on, and something that makes us weaker. And on a, you know, just a personal opinion note, while I'm one of those guys who believes in the importance of the re-emphasis on skills-based cyber and getting people who actually know how to do things within the environment, I don't want to see us bake out that people equation because we're still going to have a problem regarding implementing as we go forward. Healthcare, much like the rest of the world, is growing more and more digital with each passing day. Every new opportunity provided by technology is countered by a gap cyber attackers can exploit to the detriment of vulnerable patients. The advice from these experts will help organizations limit their risk, but the overarching message of their words is clear. The danger of a cyber attack is real, and addressing it tomorrow will already be too late. For more information on this topic and what's at stake, be sure to watch the first three installments of HIMSS TV's Deep Dive on Cybersecurity. For now, thank you for watching the fourth and final episode of the series. This has been Dave Moyo, signing off.